Uh, I'm Serena Young. I'm an assistant professor of biomedical data science at Stanford, and I'm delighted to introduce our next session, which is a fireside chat on frontiers and directions in AI and medicine. And it's my great pleasure to welcome today Eric Horvitz and John Markoff, who will be joining us for this chat. Uh, Eric Horvitz is a technical fellow at Microsoft, where he serves as the company's first chief scientific officer. He has made contributions on addressing challenges of machine learning, reasoning, and decision making amidst the complexities of the open world, including probabilistic and decision theoretic representations for reasoning and action, models of bounded rationality, and human AI complementarity and coordination. He received the Feigenbaum Prize and the Alan Newell Prize for contributions to AI. Beyond technical work, he has pursued efforts and studies on the influences of AI on people and society, including issues around ethics, law, and safety. At Stanford, Eric established the 100-year study on AI and co-founded the AI Index. Eric received both a PhD and an MD from Stanford. John Markoff is an affiliate fellow at the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. Until 2017, he was a reporter at the New York Times, beginning in March 1988 as the paper's national computer writer. He has also been a lecturer at the University of California at Berkeley School of Journalism and an adjunct faculty member of the Stanford Graduate Program on Journalism. In 2013, he was awarded a Pulitzer Prize in Explanatory Reporting as part of a New York Times project on labor and automation. He attended graduate school at the University of Oregon and received a master's degree in sociology. Thank you so much, Eric and John, for joining us today, and please take it away. Hi, Eric. Uh, so uh, thanks for doing this. And you know, I wanted to start, um, I was thinking about our conversation, and I remember that you have a background both in medicine and in computing. And once many years ago, you told me a story about your days at Stanford. And at this point, what I remember is that both, I think a rat and an apple II were involved. And it was sort of an important moment for you, as you described. And I was wondering if you remember that. And in the context, I was thinking about it, I was saying, would you have made a different decision now, um, given how far both medicine and computing have gone? But was that, was that sort of a branch point for you when you decided to go toward computing? It, there was a branch point. Uh, I came into Stanford as MD uh, with aspirations of joining it with a PhD in neurobiology and was visiting various neuroscience labs. Uh, I had come as an undergraduate with a background in monitoring uh, single neurons, it was called unit like, uh, activity uh, in rats. Um, and I remember the moment where I was in a lab um, uh, looking at an Apple II computer with this top off in a lab as they are often were off motherboards being, I mean, sort of various kinds of boards being changed in and out. And I remember thinking to myself, because um, I was really thinking deeply about human cognition and that's why I was heading towards neurosciences. Um, did I really want to um, spend my time putting a, a little electrode into something akin to one of those chips and trying to induce or infer the operating system and applications uh, wasn't that what I'd be doing for years as a neuroscientist? Uh, around the same time, I ran into Herb Simon, who was a kind of a meta mentor for me over the years. And he looked at me and he said, hmm, neuroscience, natural, you're interested in the natural sciences. And I was thinking, actually, I'm interested in the sciences of the artificial theories and foundations. I think it'll get us there more quickly. Of course, Herb Simon had a famous book called Sciences of the Artificial. That was very um, motivating for me. So I did have a branching point moment um, where part of my thinking, besides the putting electrode in the chip to induce um, theories and models, was also how slow I thought neuroscience would move in terms of getting at foundations of cognition, which is my big curiosity set of, set of questions. Uh, and I think that's borne out, even though we have fast pace in, in that area now, but the idea of getting close to uh, intelligence, cognition, decision-making, reflection, the foundations of how neurons generate minds. I don't think we've made a lot of progress on that. That's interesting. Um, so in, in a sense, you would have made the same decision half a century later. It, it, that was probably the late 70s, wasn't it? Don't you think so? It was probably late 40s. Well, saying half a century later makes me get, gets me very uh, <laughs> concerned. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's quite later. It was uh, early 80s for me. Early 80s, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think so, I, yeah, Apple IIs were still being used then. 
Yeah. So, so one of the things that has struck me in our conversations over the years, and you have had a long-term perspective. And I, I was thinking when you were uh, president of the, uh, the AI uh, Association, you led an Asilomar study that sort of tried to take stock of where you were. And then I think it was 2014, you launched this Stanford process. I guess it's going to go on for a century. And I was just wondering if you could describe um, sort of what motivated you to take that long look and was medicine part of it? Yes, it was. You know, um, I was doing research trying to bridge uh, theory with practice. And in fact, some of the theory that I was pursuing was forced in some ways by the high stakes of medical decision making because you really couldn't afford to be heuristic or have ill-characterized recommendations when it came to patients' lives. So I pushed I and a few colleagues into probability theory and the formal foundations of mathematics, which was not popular at the time, I, I have to say, um, and created quite a bit of tension with some advisors. Uh, it was, that was, this was the era of expert systems, of production systems, logic, chaining. Uh, and and to, to me, that didn't seem to be the right approach given the complexity of the real world. So there is some background in the, in the stakes of the decisions I was looking at, uh, but that study uh, and my presidency came at an interesting time for AI. It was uh, 2008, 2009, you do a two year presidency and you do a president elect two years before that and then a past presidency. And every president of AAAI, the AI society has a chance to define a set of themes and give a presidential lecture and stand up various programs. I decided my theme would be right at 2008, AI in the open world, because we were just beginning to get beyond this notion of it works, the heck with making it polished and worrying about social implications, even though if that was even a thought at all, it was more like we got this thing to work. Uh, and it's clearly going to be useful. We probably help people out in various ways. Um, and that was starting to happen. In fact, 2009, if you think about this, was the that summer was when um, um, deep neural networks were found to actually work better than some of the traditional machine learning efforts. And we discovered that summer that they had been famished for data all this time. But right at this cusp, AI in the open world, I decided to give my lecture, which is online, about methods for building humble AI systems that understood their own, own uncertainties and their own blind spots that would work in a trustworthy way. And at the same time, I stood up a study on the, I would say, call it socio-technical issues, which at the time seemed a little outrageous. I got some pushback on this, like, why are you doing this, Eric? And it was on uh, building a, a set of, of breakout groups that would meet for several months, finally culminating in that Asilomar meeting at Asilomar in Pacific Grove, a short-term disruption uh, subcommittee, a long-term futures committee, and then a special focus on... Um, ethics and law. Uh, and it was quite a, an eye-opening experience for me just to hear what people had come up with. It was the first time I heard the term, it's quite prescient, especially from what we're hearing these days, criminal AI. What were applications by nation states and non-nation state actors that would be criminal in using these powers of AI? We've come a long way. <laughs> and so, and so um, translating these technologies into the medical field. Um, so, you know, neural nets have exploded. Um, you know, I, maybe the Bayesian world that you pioneered was actually in some ways closer to, to the, the probabilistic neural nets than people give credit for, but they did, you didn't have the data. So now we, like you described, they work. And what's the pace that you see in which this technology is actually sort of translating itself into the, into the field? You know, let me first say that um, if you go back to 1959, Ledley and Lusted paper in science that many folks in biomedical informatics and AI and medicine look at as the foundational paper which described, even if it was using cards on rails, Bayesian inference to do diagnosis, next best questions being asked, decision theory to, ba to balance costs and benefits and making recommendations. Um, some of the foundations that were laid out then and then revisited uh, in, in the Bayesian network era, we'll call it in the mid to late 80s and early 90s, uh, have been left behind now, given the excitement of neural nets. So the first thing I would say is we shouldn't 
give up um, and we should be, we should be more uh, willing and aware of the shoulders of the giants of the past. <laughs> Let's leave me out of that right now, but past uh, innovation and work as we move forward to think deeply about all the ways uh, that, uh, that AI methods, the constellation of technologies we call AI could be used. Um, now moving to neural nets, um, it's an alternate method being, that you can uh, learn from large amounts of data, uh, especially valuable where you have large amounts of, of data of the appropriate kind. So we, where we're seeing uh, a great progress in terms of the laboratory right now, we can get into why we don't see fast paced translation that we might expect just yet. Uh, we have um, applications in pathology and radiology where we have rich imagery data sets. Imagery is like high bandwidth data, lots of images. It's very amenable to, to training up deep neural networks to recognize and segment, uh, for example, to identify um, uh, various uh, diseases uh, from the patterns of histology on slides um, uh, in dermatology, as well as, um, you know, sort of what the images are showing in radiology of various kinds of modalities. It's less powerful um, when you have smaller data sets. And unfortunately to date, some of the data we have on electronic health records in terms of the clinical notes and findings and, and, and um, reflections and plans and uh, impressions and so on, uh, signs and symptoms is a little bit more sparse. So in many ways we see still applications of I'd say traditional machine learning methods um, uh, being ap applied effectively to generate, uh, for example, recommendations and predictions, uh, rank lists of diseases that might be present given a set of symptoms. This is called the differential diagnosis in healthcare in, me in medical settings, um, but also at times uh, deep neural nets. And in fact, uh, we see studies of what methods to apply the older methods and the new methods, which will work better in different situations and some interesting work on trade-offs and um, guides as to which method to use in healthcare, given a goal. So, um, in, you know, in a field like radiology, my sense is that communications technologies have been a much more important factor to date in terms of changing the workflow and the way the field has organized itself than machine learning. Um, I, I was, in preparing for this, I was looking at, at an article and it's, it, it asserted that uh, machine learning technologies are already being deployed, but I had the sense that that's mostly yet to come. Do you have a sense of, of whether machine learning will have the kind of impact that communication technologies had over the last two decades? And we say communication to mean networking, infrastructure. Yeah, the ability to move the documents around and have them. Yeah. yeah. I think it's going to be really important, and this is something I've learned over the years in in being, especially when I was an excited young grad student, interested in taking this, let's say, this diagnostic system and showing it to doctors, and being very, being very disappointed when they said, "Yeah, that's that's really nice and a fine fine machine you've built, but I like the imagery, uh, the image data that you have better." And I said, well, "But it's doing it's it's computing diseases you might uh, you know not see otherwise. It's helping you with ranking." And prioritizing your your, uh, your your information gathering, the next test to do, and and part of this is that at time I think it's very common for um, computer science researchers, even those who are dipping their toes strongly into the domains like healthcare, to not fully appreciate all the complexities, preferences, patterns of activity, nuances, human factors associated with the richness of an area like radiology. Um, I think Kurt Langlotz, the director of Amy, has made this comment that AI basically will be used by, you know, radiologists that, that will be, you know, be the ones that stay in business. The question is how? Um, you know, for example, I've spoken to radiologists who's, who tell me, yeah, I, you know, I like the imagery and the segmentation, but I do a great job at that. That's not really the, the uh, costly part of my work. Now, if you can give me a report generator that would say, take my findings and you know, write me out a beautiful report, that takes time and that's kind of a pain point as an example. But all the work that goes on, I think radiology is a great example um, of, a, of, of an area that really uh, could be investigated deeply for what are all the interesting points in a pipeline of what's done with a particular imaging request, study and outcome and recommend, set of recommendations. Um, where would AI be the most valuable and, and when, how, what's the transition for rolling it out given the status quo of the patterns of, 
of work today. Uh, so I think we all have ideas that radiology is looking at a film, um, but there are probably <clears throat> scores of decisions that human experts are making a lot with deep expertise, common sense, understanding how the organization works between the ordering physician, uh, the patient, the actual uncertainty and what a model might even be thinking about uh, when it comes to the you know, correlation among different observations. So yes, there probably will be straightforward applications. Like, like for example, and this is an example I use a lot, um, pap smears. You know, we went from this area of, um, uh, of cellular, you know, uh, pathology, histology, looking at, uh, it was called say, cytology, looking at uh, pap smears under a microscope, but now there are machines that go bam, 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 and just you know, do that work, automate that. EKG machines, you know, bam, there's a, of course, you want a cardiologist still, but you get, you know, kind of an interesting summary and, and an analysis. And there'll be places like that, uh, that might change the borders of when an expert is needed, for example, at a teaching hospital, or where, when a slide is sent out to a, to an expert in a particular one of the 40 tissue areas of the human body versus um, led by a community pathologist. And those are really interesting situations. And we see like papers, in fact, Stanford published uh, two interesting papers, one in pathology of, um, for dermatology, uh, and the other uh, was um, in, uh, in radiology, this Chexpert work, where we see incredible powers on the image side. So it's undoubted, it's, it's, I'm, I have no doubts that those applications will find their ways into healthcare. The question is how and when, and will there be other techniques and methods that might surprise us? Uh, for example, um, you, know, uh, you know, decision analysis that help uh, radiologists and ordering physicians to understand which is what modality might be best given the concerns and the uncertainties and the, and the, and the blind spots that people are worried about with an illness. So, you know, if you go all the way back to 1962 and the dawn of interactive computing at Stanford, there were these two labs. One was John McCarthy's lab and the other was Doug Engelbart's lab. They were on opposite sides of campus. And McCarthy set out to see what it took to replace a human being. He called it artificial intelligence. He was the one who named the term. And on the other side of campus, the same year, Engelbart set out to do what he called uh, augment the human, intelligence augmentation. So you had this dichotomy. I and mean, it was very striking to me that it happened at Stanford and it happened right at the dawn of interactive computing. And that tension has, has stayed uh, with the field until today. I, you know, I'm, and let's talk about the field of radiology. Uh, and, and I guess they refer to these now as centaur applications where some part is done by human, some part is done by machine and they work in partnership. But I think Steve Jobs described it best um, when he referred to the computer as a bicycle for the mind. That was sort of the most evocative way I've heard it described. But can you, I mean, is, so how will you get there and what do you keep of the human and what do you keep of the machine? Well, it's a really good question. And I think um, I, I used to have this sense until recently that we should just let uh, technology and free enterprise evolve to figure that out on its own. Uh, and more recently, I've been thinking more deeply about being mindful about getting to better futures by thinking about the steps uh, along the way uh, and ways to maybe non-obvious ways we might uh, think about human AI teaming, which is an area that I've become very interested in over the years. Um, let me just say that um, when I saw this, and you've done beautiful writings about this, John, but when I saw this tension between, and it was well characterized, between uh, augmenting human intelligence and AI automation, um, I was already in this mode of not really distinguishing the two because I was thinking, wow, AI methods should be applied to augmentation, but it's not an easy problem. Um, so as opposed to thinking about straightforward automation and there will be roles for automation like the pap smear slides going through the machine and then paper being printed out or a display showing what's this, what the situation is or assessed. Um, but I think that th there's a, such a huge role for uh, extending the intellect of people uh, in healthcare by understanding, for example, cognitive blind spots. You know, I, I go back to this uh, this comment. I know I, I, I've presented this quite a bit, this result, because it was so striking to me, this Johns Hopkins report uh, from 2016. Uh, it was a credible report that went into details of how you compute this, but that 250,000 
over 250,000 lives per year are, that would, are, are, pe are people dying in, that would be prevented from human error, like based in human error or human misjudgment or not sort of doing the right things fast enough. Uh, and my reaction was, wow, let's just pause. Let's just take a deep breath about what people are doing with AI systems. And when you think that if this analysis is correct, that the third killer of Americans, probably worldwide too, the same stat would hold after heart disease and cancer, but pre-COVID was, uh, you know, human error, human and 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 uh, gaps in human judgment. So I said, okay, let's say, let's just we should just pause, pause, look at the detailed error analysis. What give me the classes of error, and not about replacement necessarily, or even uh, uh, ideas about centaurs. But could we build safety nets under the painters on the bridge to just catch people when they fall? Um, by understanding the details of the biases, gaps, cognitive errors, memory problems, recall surprises that might surprise experts, things hiding in cognitive shadows, for example, better to understand that and build systems that reason about the error landscape for humans and just start there and see if we can basically, you know, cut out a big chunk of these, these deaths. And that guided some of my own research to looking at, again, the I like this picture that I show when I give a talk on this of 19, whatever, 1920s uh, of the nets under the Golden Gate Bridge and workers dangling as they as they painted, but felt good because they would just fall into the net versus into the into the bay. Yeah. So, so what would what form would take? I mean, there's been a lot made about the importance of just something as simple as a checklist in medicine. Um, can you add to the checklist with some sort of? Well, I I think at Stanford they've done research. Um, just to watch people to make sure they wash their hands, something that right, simple. Yeah. Um, but, well, in between that, where where could you, how would you de uh, deploy systems to, to prevent errors? Okay. Let me just say that people really passionate about making a difference need to be prepared to do boring, uh, less exciting work in AI to figure out great, and non-AI checklists, to uh, just displaying a checklist, to, to figure out how to make healthcare better. Uh, and um, I think there's still plenty of uh, hard challenges where the, I'd say the sexier, harder AI uh, 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 methods will be extremely valuable. Um, but even for them, thinking about where they'd fit in, especially in the flow of today's life uh, and thinking about evolution of the field, taking people forward in, in, with, with more precision, um, more um, sensitivity to, to, to results, more um, uh, cognizant of cost benefit. These methods would have a huge, you could have, could be big wins. Let me just say that um, uh, hats off to, to Fei Fei and uh, uh, Serena and others that worked on the, on the hand washing uh, challenge. And I'm sorry to leave other authors out, but it's the kind of thing that you, you, you can see people, um, you know, at, at the like latest late breaking eye clear meeting saying, oh God, looking at hand washing, well, okay. Uh, but in reality, there's some big wins we, we should not be overlooking. And it, that is the tip of the iceberg of, of opening up and looking more carefully in, you know, and, you know, with all the power we have, including design techniques, um, tracking methods, um, techniques for making sure that when a team transitions, that the notes are presented properly so the new team understands for continuity. Um, lots of big wins there. And even lightweight um, machine learning, logistic regression with the right data sets can go a long way uh, to, to, um, to helping and making a huge dent in, in various areas of healthcare. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in terms of I want to talk about workflow in a slightly different direction. Most of my visits to the doctor these days involve situations just like this. Uh, I, I, most of my medicine now is delivered via telehealth. All of a sudden, you know, it just happened like that overnight. But I, I think I saw that Microsoft Research has done some research in terms of adding sensors to that. And that, that hasn't happened in the real world yet, has it? Is it possible that it will? I mean, my 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 computer has a webcam. Um, what can you do before besides show my image to the doctor? Well, I have two comments there. Uh, one is yes, there's been a, a rising community, kind of, uh, you know, it's 
over the years is bubbling and more work's going on now and Microsoft and other places at asking the question, what sensors would be the most valuable cost benefit in, um, in, um, in, in, in extending what we can do uh, from the home? The second uh, direction, which you and I uh, uh, should talk more about, which is a very exciting one, and thanks for bringing it up, is we could use AI methods to figure out when someone sh should come in. You know, so, so this is the active learning or value of information computations. When is it in a conversation or with any, any sensing that's available, including imagery, that is an indication it would really be good to bring this patient in and do this, these set of tests and to talk to them about this, but look at them more closely. And the idea of thinking about the, um, you know, online telemedicine versus the expense of the, and time and transportation uh, and time slots of people coming in and sitting and, and seeing a doctor, that interface is a prime example uh, of where AI could play a role in a way that would be non-obvious if you're sort of thinking about where can I insert this AI technology, especially today with what happened with, with the pandemic and distance uh, diagnosis and, and consultation. Well, which takes me in the direction I really wanted to ask you. So a lot has been um, said about um, the, the progress made in um, imaging uh, and sort of, you know, using AI uh, techniques to get these systems to sort of uh, exceed human capabilities in terms of very, in very specific tests. But now all of a sudden in the last two years, we've got, well, maybe last one year, we have these language models. Um, and the language models, uh, do they provide another direction for, I mean, to, to specifically to your point about when you bring someone in, if you had a conversation with a, a, a patient, could you extract meaningfully medical re relevant information from the conversation that the, that, the, that the, you know, the doctor might not even know, but the machine might know? Is yeah, that, especially, uh, especially, especially if you had um, uh, enough training data, that's a really nice direction. In fact, uh, the direction uh, with large scale um, neural models is not just language, but to add vision, uh, for example, um, radiology images and the text annotations that go with them. Uh, and, and there's a nice data set coming out of Stanford uh, in this area uh, and to train uh, dual embeddings or multiple multimodal embeddings that in quotes that capture uh, different dimensions all in the same place and summarize over them to make things like diagnostic calls or referral calls or should I come in calls um, uh, given the right kind of training data. There's a lot to be learned in this very fast paced area with lots of attention focus right now in the engineering sense in large scale neural models of starting with the, the advances made in large scale um, uh, neural language models developed via this technique called self-supervision on massive data sets. Uh, the question is going to be, do we have enough training data for these kinds of operations? For example, you can imagine you want to tag uh, every consultation uh, in, in the training set and, you know, with what happened and what was the outcome, which that reduces the data set and gets expensive to tag and annotate. So yeah, this is a nice, it's a very interesting direction. I think we are in, the, in a world now, I should say, where you hear words like fine tuning of large scale neural models. The compute's been done largely. We have this platform now, models as platform that we can fine tune with smaller amounts of data to do tasks like the one you, you suggested, John. And I think we're all very hopeful and have lots of high expectations for how those might be used for a variety of medical tasks. Okay. Um, you know, the other thing I wanted to ask about the language models and related AI technologies so at the beginning of COVID, there was a lot made of building these databases out of scientific knowledge that was collected around COVID and making it available. Have AI tools been deployed on that? And do you know if there have been any, are the tools being used in a useful way to make scientific uh, advances? Well, I think so. Um, so you talk about the CORD-19 data set uh, and larger studies of various kinds of visualizations and search and retrieval efforts. <clears throat> so, uh, just I don't like to to, to uh, talk about our own work necessarily, but there's a Microsoft biomedical search that was built on Cord19 and the PubMed crawl of the PubMed database from National Library of Medicine that's available online now that allows doctors uh, and the similar systems out there from other places to actually search for exactly what they want in a way that builds vectors in this embedding space that we think gets them to the 
right answers or answers much more quickly. And it came out of the COVID pressure and the explosion of papers that uh, publications, including lots of bioarchive papers, pre pre peer review uh, that were um, uh, uh, coming out, uh, helping people with the explosion of knowledge. You know, remember, COVID nineteen was not just the coronavirus, SARS CoV two. It was all the coronavirus data going back for decades. Uh, and so there has been great work, PubMed, BERT, other kinds of medical versions of the BERT training methodology being used in a variety of places. Um, and I've been in, in impressed with, with the, the advances and I think we'll see what it means to search and do retrieval in healthcare to find the right answers change dramatically over the next few years. Okay, one, one last uh, point point, and that is cost in medicine. And I want to ask it in a, in a, I guess, a difficult way, because I've thought often, so if you can augment a, a medical professional and you're worried about the cost of the system, should you augment doctors or perhaps should you augment physician's assistants and dispense with doctors? Um, I, I mean, those are tough decisions. I mean, have you thought about it that way at all? Yeah, I think that um, we need to do large scale, larger scale, uh, I want to say more comprehensive economic analyses of all the agency uh, and, and intelligence in the mix uh, for different fields of healthcare. Um, the work that I um, actually described at the Stanford uh, HAI Spring uh, Symposium a few months back talked about introducing even cost benefit into machine learning so you can see trades between efficacy uh, and, you know, and, and cost and in the context of a model that was running in the hospital making predictions uh, per ideal recommendations and outcomes. So the idea of just in general, which hasn't been done very much, taking economic ideas, whether it be for the whole system end to end and looking at pieces and how to move the chess pieces around of how healthcare is delivered, telemedicine versus in person. And the idea is where do you um, um, uh, put, um, AI systems, when it comes to the value of the system of a particular configuration being dipped into the mix and how to even have the AI systems themselves do the cost benefit. Uh, so I think this is a really important area. We see, unfortunately, way too little cost benefit, benefit considerations in modern AI work going on today. It's mostly Thank pattern recognition. You. Yeah, un understood. Thank you. We've taken our half hour, but I really appreciate it. Oh, it's fun, John, catching up. I always like uh, hearing your thoughts and talking with you. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Eric and John, for that terrific chat. Uh, next up, we'll have a one-hour lunch break, which is also when we'll be holding interactive breakout sessions on Zoom. We invite you to drop in on one or more of the 10 discussions that will be led by the Amy team and the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI. Please use the link in the Slido chat box to access the Zoom room. Okay, have a great time.